Hello, this is Cynthia Ye. Hi, my name is Crystal Pearson, and this is the Earn and Invest podcast. According to a recent article on Bankrate from Kim Porter, credit has increased Americans' purchasing power, helping them buy homes, cars, and other goods. It's also normalized debt across the United States. As of September 2021, consumer debt is at $14.96 trillion, with the average American owing $92,727, which includes credit card balances, student loans, mortgages, and more. While it's easy to look at these numbers and be appalled, we forget that behind them are millions of individual stories, each with their own details and nuance. Well, today, we're going to explore two of those stories. Cynthia Ye's passion is to better this world. She's worked in different industries, including IT, hardware integration, auditing, international development, international business, and in the non-for-profit sector. She's also paid off over $100,000. Crystal Pearson is fascinated by the interconnectedness of organizations, processes, and the people that drive them. So it's no surprise that a career in talent acquisition is what she ultimately chose. She tackled just over $90,000 of debt. Cynthia and Crystal, welcome to Earn and Invest. Cynthia, let's start with you. Tell me about your worst moment when it comes to debt. When was it as bad as it was going to get? I hope that I never have it as bad as it was about six years ago. I was living out of my car. And it's not the same thing as camper vans where you're going camping. I had no choice and was forced to live out of my car in order not to spiral into further debt. That means borrowing off my credit card and not being able to pay them off at the end of the month. I was sleeping in my sleeping bag, parked in remote little areas, and then showering at the gym And that, I would say, was the low point of my financial journey. And Cynthia, was there a point where you really had to sit there and say, I could go into more debt, like people would give me more money, but then I would be worse off versus, boy, I'm just going to sleep in my car, even if I possibly could end up somewhere maybe a little more comfortable? While it wasn't where I am now and what I am on my fire financial journey, I was taught to be frugal and I wasn't intelligent enough to know that when there's interest and you borrow money, it just gets worse if you borrow more and more and more money. So I was aware that I could have borrowed more money, but it was that slope, like that turning point where I knew that if I started down that road, it would have been devastating. So I decided to make it an adventure and I picked a time frame and, and did a little bit of research, but made it in my mind more of an adventure that I needed to conquer than have it overwhelm me and de- be depressing. Was that kind of the turning point when you decide, hey, I'm going to make this a little bit of a game? Is that when things started to get better? Yes. I lived out of my car for about three months and just kind of stopped the bleeding, the hemorrhaging of debt. And by doing that, I was able to turn things around. And I knew that I needed to get through that time. It's just a lot of things added up and things were spiraling. So that challenge had to have happened and I had to get through it to get to the other side. Crystal, talk about the same thing. Did you have these really bad debt moments where you're like, okay, this is as bad as it can get because I can't take any more? I think the most terrifying moment for me was when I faced the music in terms of how much I actually owed. My car lease was up. So of course I wasn't a planner (laughs) back in 2017, but I still needed a car to get back and forth to work and things of that nature. So go sit down across from the car salesman. I'm like, hey, I need a car. Perfect. Let's run your credit. So they ran the credit report and I just saw the look on the guy's face. He slid it across the table. And that's when I just saw everything that I owed. And I was so upset. And at that point, how much did you owe, Crystal? And what type of debt was it? 
I owed and paid off $90,308. The lion's share was student loans. That was about $72,000. And then outside of that, I had one credit card and I also paid off my car. Cynthia, answer the same question. How much debt did you have and what type of debt was it? I had over $100,000 in debt and I did not and do not want to know exactly how much it was. I do know that the majority of it was student debt and also some medical expenses because I did do this program called the Peace Corps where you live abroad for two years. And when I came back, I had some injuries still that hadn't healed from it. And the medical support system isn't fantastic when you come back to the States and there isn't much support. So I had a medical bills that Creditors started calling me, and and so that was a majority. I did have other debt, too, but they didn't have any interest on it. So I I have a car, and I had a loan on it, but that wasn't the same as the other ones because they had compound interest. Crystal, you did something funny, which I didn't fully realize until Cynthia answered the same question. She said, you know, I had something over $100,000 of debt, and you gave us your amount of debt to the exact dollar, not to the penny. But to the dollar, was it important for you or is it even important now for you to know exactly how bad it got? It was extremely important for me to really assess how much I owed. And even now with the debt gone as of this June, I still think about that number often because I I think it helps keep me in check and remember just how far I've come on my journey. You both had various sources of debt. Are some types of debt better than others? I mean, did it feel better if the lion's share was, for instance, student debt, Crystal? No, I don't really believe in good debt or bad debt. I think debt is just debt. And when you're facing numbers that are that high, it can be extremely scary. So it, it was it was just a, a bad thing. <laughs> Cindy, as I listen to your stories, I think about a lot of my financial know-how was learned by my parents. I mean, I modeled behavior that my parents showed me when it came to finances. And I was thinking about this episode today and wondering, did you have models that you grew up with, people who you saw being in debt? Like, was this a normal thing that you grew up with or saw? Or is when you got yourself in debt, was that the first time you were really facing this issue? It's very interesting that you asked that question because it's not too long ago, just a few months during the summer where I was hiking with my mom. And we spoke about college debt and where I am now and my struggle and how come she didn't do the, is it the 529? Like save up and do stocks and investments because she migrated here when she was a child and she was more aware of programs such as stocks and investments. And my grandparents were farmers, so they did not have that when they immigrated to America. But in talking to my mom, now that I'm older and more mature and and more solid with where I'm at. My mother, she didn't, she didn't know this stuff. I mean, she lived in it, but there wasn't the same resources like looking online. People didn't talk about money. So she is, she, I didn't, I was not able to learn this from my parents and still at this moment, she's still learning information from me as I continue on this fire journey. So the answer is no, I did not have this information at my grasp growing up. When Cynthia talks about her fire journey, she's talking about financial independence, retire early. Crystal, did you have any role models, people who maybe you had seen in debt as a kid? And furthermore, could you talk about this debt with your family members? So when I was growing up, we didn't really talk a ton about money. I just remember my parents always warning me against credit cards and said, you know, don't take out a bunch of credit cards. So of course I didn't, I had one credit card, but then I just ran up a bunch of student loans. (laughs) So that was the situation that I was in, but along my journey, I've been very transparent with my parents about how much I owed and kind of the situation I was in and, and how I journeyed to pay it off. Cynthia, so much of talking about debt today, especially in young professionals, is talking about student loan debt. I think a lot of us are taught when we're kids that that's that kind of quote unquote good debt. Do you have any regret about spending on your education? Do you feel like you could have done it differently? Retrospect? Yes. I don't 
know if that was the best choice. And I say this because for my undergraduate, I worked three jobs. I worked summer and winter. I hustled. So I didn't graduate with debt from my undergrad. It was when I came back from the Peace Corps and decided that I wanted to go to graduate school because it was a recession and I really wanted to help the world with sustainability. And most of everyone else that exited Peace Corps also went to graduate school. That was the natural step. So I followed the pack and went to graduate school and went to this wonderful school, international, renowned, great people, great program, but it was very expensive. And that's the majority. That was about $100,000, the cost to go to that two-year school. And I look at my peers and most of them, I would say 90% of them are still in debt. And I don't know if they'll ever get out of it. So is it worth it? I'm free. I paid off my debt last year in August. And I'm I'm at that burden. I feel like I'm free to, if I want to go back to sustainability and help others, I may do so. But I had to help myself first. So I had to get out of that student debt. How long did it take you to pay off all that greater than $100,000 of debt? Five years. Five, six years? Hold on. When did I graduate? More than five years. I think it was between seven and five years. So, Crystal, I feel like we've talked kind of about the bad side of your story, right? The getting in debt, the feeling like it was building up and you couldn't do anything about it. I think there are a lot of people who are stuck right there at that moment. And I wonder, do you think it's more of a tactical thing? Like I need to change how I'm spending right now, or is it more of a mindset thing? Like what got you over the hump? Was it that you changed your mind or you changed what you did or both? What I will say is that a lot of people that are in similar situations to myself and Cynthia are lacking hope. And I truly believe that it is behavioral, but it's mindset as well, because you can have all of the right behaviors. But if you don't believe that you can pay your debt off, it's going to be awfully hard to do it. So I had to really surround myself with other people who you know, we're debt free. I joined lots of different groups on Facebook so that I could network with other people. I had to see it being done to really feel that I could achieve that as well. Cynthia, talk about that feeling of hopelessness, not about feeling hopeless, but how you overcame it. For me, it was fear, mindset, and knowledge. It wasn't for lack of trying. I can say that I tried tried so hard and spent so much energy doing so many different things, but it it wasn't until I put all that energy into the right actions. These, I would say it's like life hacks almost, where things turned around. Do I work as hard now hustling as what I did then? Yes, I'm a hustler. Like I, I I will run in the hamster wheel and I'll try and try, but I was putting all this energy into things that were not setting myself up for success. I hope that answers your question. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it does. And Crystal, I want to get more tactical so we can talk about exactly how you started fixing this debt problem. But first and foremost, are you debt free, Crystal? And how long did it take you to get there? Yes, I've been debt free since June of this year. Thank goodness. (laughs) And it took me about three years. And so let's talk about some of those tactics, Crystal. I mean, I hear people talk about the debt avalanche versus the debt snowball versus, you know, you hear all these terms. What were some of the tactical things that really seemed to help you when you started? I was debt snowball all the way because I needed to see those quick wins to continue my momentum. So my partner purchased Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University for me. So I attended that. And that's when I started to go through the baby step program and, you know, baby step one, you save a thousand dollars. And then I entered baby step two, where you kind of pay off all of your debt. I started off a little bit slow in the beginning because I didn't understand how to budget and really what the value of it was. I'd never done it before, but I learned about a program called YNAB, you need a budget. I don't know if if Jesse Meekum will ever hear this, but that program definitely changed my life. And I don't know if I would be debt-free now without YNAB. The debt snowball is paying off the smallest debt first and making some headway. And then you keep on doing the small ones until you get to the big ones. Whereas the debt avalanche is you go for the lowest interest or the highest interest rate first. Cynthia, I'm wondering, 
did you had you heard of Dave Ramsey? So many people who come at debt say, boy, the first person they heard was Dave Ramsey. Was Dave Ramsey part of your plan or or if not, who did you kind of first learn about taking care of debt? Dave Ramsey was also my first, and I listened to him for about two years, his podcast. And I am opposite of Crystal in that I use that avalanche method because I'm, I'm very logical like that. But I didn't know about the FIRE community or, or other FIRE resources besides Dave Ramsey until a few months, until a little while later, after I was still in debt, but I was making headways into the debt with Dave Ramsey's help. Grissel, I'm, I'm very interested in Dave Ramsey because I hear the story over and over again. People who are deeply in debt usually start Dave Ramsey as the gateway, but it appears that they tend to graduate from him after a certain amount of time. Did that happen to you? And, and what made you move on kind of past Dave Ramsey to start listening either to other people or to start looking at other places to learn how to manage your money? I would definitely agree with that. I think Dave Ramsey was very helpful to me when the house was on fire and, and you know I didn't really know how to manage my finances. But after a while, I got the basics down and I really was seeking more advanced financial knowledge. And I stumbled upon the Choose FI Facebook group. And that's how I learned about the FIRE community and more about investing vehicles and things of that nature. And, and I've really been embracing that ever since. Cynthia, I feel like it's always like this big question, right? The two sides of the equation, you either have to save more or you have to make more money. And I'm wondering, what do you think has impacted either your debt payoff or now your financial independence plan more? Are you one of those people who is aggressively a saver, uh, maybe a person who likes frugality versus are you more of a top line person who's like, okay, I need to just make a lot more money? I now am a person that makes a lot more money or, or am tackling and trying to constantly challenge myself to make more money because that was one of the mindset hurdles I had to overcome. I, for many years, decades, just tried to optimize how frugal I could be. And sometimes for me, like I will go buy like discounted meats and whatnot just to be that frugal. But after looking at my spreadsheet and realizing that I really can't be more frugal living in the Bay Area, I had to change my mindset and add lines to the top going, how do I increase my income so that I can work on this instead of trying to squeeze another drop of frugality out of my life? You mentioned living in the Bay Area, Cynthia. That's a very high cost of living area. Did debt ever push you to consider moving? Listening and hearing about from other fire people, people in this financial freedom community, and, and learning about the different locations that are so beautiful in, in America and around the world has me tempted to thinking about relocating. However, I know one of the core values that I have is my family, and the majority of my family lives in the Bay Area. So I will visit other places, but my home and my roots are here. Crystal, let's talk a little about debt and career. Did you find yourself making career choices based on the debt? Did it affect your eventual career trajectory? Uh, I'm not sure that I made career choices based on the debt, but I knew that I could only cut so much from my budget, but there was really no limit on how much I could earn. And I realized that I really wanted to invest in my skill set. And that's how I was able to earn various promotions, move across different companies and, and really focus on getting my income up so that I didn't really have to side hustle to pay down my debt. Cynthia, I'd ask the same question. Do you think debt was a major driver of major career choices? Yes. One of the pivotal things I had to do was from my not so fun, well, my fun adventure six years back was changing careers. And I had to do a good amount of soul searching and resituating because I went to school and went to Peace Corps and I went to graduate school to work in a certain field. And I developed a significant amount of experience and networking, fellowships and internships, working with nonprofits and sustainability and conservation. But then living in the Bay Area and realizing that my family's here. So I need to figure out a way to stay here. Unfortunately, 
for me, I wasn't able to find job opportunities that matched the high cost of living in the Bay Area. So I had to pivot and I pivoted to technology. So right now I work in tech and I will be working tech for a while because I use a lot of the similar skills, but it's a different field that pays more than double. Crystal, I feel like there are a lot of people probably listening right now who feel kind of in that pit of debt. They feel like their debt is at its highest. You both came through this. What do you think is the best first step? Like if someone is feeling like it's gotten as bad as it's going to get, how do they start digging themselves out? I think first, it's really important to be able to assess exactly how much you owe and to whom you owe that money to. For me, I found that once I pulled the curtain back and I faced the music on the numbers, it, it it couldn't scare me anymore. Prior to that, it was like the boogeyman in the closet. But once you know, you can really take decisive action. And then I would say budgeting is paramount in this journey. I don't, I couldn't have gotten, became debt free if I wasn't diligent with budgeting. And I mean, down to the penny. Cynthia, I'd ask you the same question. For those who are really struggling, who feel like they haven't been able to make any headway, is there a good first step? I think the good first step I would recommend is emotional. There's a lot of fear and anxiety that goes along with just seeing how much debt we're in. And there's a certain amount of fear, too, in trying to stop it because it does seem like an avalanche. Unfortunately, that's the way money and debt goes, it's a weight that can grow and it's heavy. It's a burden. So trying to stop it and then trying to push against it and dig your way out, it's scary. Once you realize and and make that effort and slowly dig a way at it, it does get lighter. You get stronger. You learn so much from it. And once that debt's gone, you come out on the other side, a stronger, more competent and confident person. Krista, we mentioned Dave Ramsey as a resource, but any other tips and tricks to kind of help you deal with that fear? Because it sounds like kind of making that emotional turn, getting past that fear and start seeing hope is like a big part of starting the process. How can we do that? I think it's very, very important to connect with other people who are in a similar situation to yourself. We live in an age of social media where, you know, everybody's posting their highlight reels and it may seem like you're alone, but joining those Facebook groups was super pivotal in me realizing that, wait a minute, I'm one of millions of people in America that are fighting through this and there is a support system out there. So I joined those uh, Facebook groups. I'm on Instagram as well. And I joined the the hashtag debt-free community. And that's how I continue to follow all of these different accounts that talked about paying off your debt. And I realized, oh, wow, people are doing this and I can do this too. Cynthia, did you develop debt buddies, people that kind of you connected with because of your debt? Yes, I too have joined many of the Facebook groups. So when I do have little tricky questions, I'll dig through that and just, you know, type hashtag, how do I, which stocks are smart stocks, which ones are risky stocks and, and things like that. But I also have a closer group of people that are maybe slightly ahead of me. I don't know quite how to describe it, but a bubble of people that are in different circumstances, but are not judgmental and supportive. And I may make mistakes still. I mean, I am human and not perfect, but I am going towards this goal and I'm surrounding myself with other people that want to support me. And they they themselves may also be on the same journey. Crystal, is there a message for those undergoing this debt issue about hanging out and dealing with people who are not in debt? I mean, Cynthia just mentioned judgmental, and I know that there can be people in your life who are very judgmental. Did you find yourself discussing debt issues with people who weren't facing the same difficulties you were, and was it beneficial? At first, I didn't really talk to anybody about it because, again, I felt like I was the only one. But as I started to tackle it and to Cynthia's point, gain that mental fortitude and that confidence, then I became more transparent. And that's how I was able to connect with other people in a similar situation. But surprisingly, people were not judgmental. People would come up to me and say, oh, my gosh, I'm dealing with the same exact thing when I had no prior clue. (laughs) 
We are talking with Crystal Pearson and Cynthia Ye. They together were more than $200,000 in debt. We're going to take a quick break. I'm Doc G, and this is Earn and Invest. Hey, everybody. I just wanted to remind you that if you want to connect with me, Jordan Grummet, also known as Doc G, there are a few different ways to do it. First and foremost, there's jordangrummet.com. That's J-O-R-D-A-N-G-R-U-M-E-T.com. Right now, that's being diverted to my old medical blog, but eventually it will be a hub for all things Doc G, Earn and Invest, and my new book, Taking Stock. So check me out, jordangrummet.com. Also, there is our Earn and Invest Facebook group. Just go to earnandinvest.com slash Facebook. Here we discuss topics similar to what you hear on the podcast, but it is 24-7 We discuss economics, personal finance, the financial independence movement, you name it, we discuss it there. And last but not least, you can go to earnandinvest.com to get the latest episodes, videos, and blog posts. Check us out. We hope to see you at any of these places as well as the podcast you're listening to today. Now back to the show. Let me reintroduce you. We are talking to Cynthia Ye and Crystal Pearson. As of September 2021, consumer debt in America was up to $14.96 trillion. Crystal, tell me about what the process of paying off your debt has done for your sense of self and your sense of self-esteem. How do you feel about yourself today compared to when you were in the midst of the debt crisis? It's made me confident that I can do anything. Paying off the debt was the most difficult thing I've ever done. And it's enhanced my problem solving skills and just the ability to stick with something and finish. It's incredible. Cynthia, do you feel different about yourself? Has your perception changed over time? Yes. Going through this challenge and traveling on this journey has taught me that I can accomplish a lot. But more than that, it's actually allowed me to feel comfortable being vulnerable. Like like Crystal has said, like there is a sense of hopelessness and it's not something that's very easy to share with others. But now, maybe now that I'm peeking out the other side, I feel more inspired by myself and that gives me the confidence to be able to share my journey because I hope that it helps inspire others to see that you're not alone. Many people have or can or will be going through this and that if you are willing to share your story, there will be others that are willing to help us help you. Crystal, tell me what it feels like to share some of that vulnerability and tell your debt story. How do people react to it, especially other people in debt? People have responded extremely well to it. People have come to me and and told me their stories and asked me for advice on, on debt payoff. And it's, it's been amazing. I've made some really great connections. And to Cynthia's point, just being able to express vulnerability, it's helped create strong connections with other people. Cynthia, any regrets? I mean, when you look back, Is there anything you would have done differently? And I'm not talking about before when you were getting into debt, but when you started that kind of debt payoff journey, was there anything you'd change now looking back? I don't think I would change anything after that turning point, but there were definitely many things I would have changed before. I did not understand the medical system and medical debt in America. I didn't understand the the interest rates and how it can really, it's heavy avalanche of going to grad school. And, and just a few other things there. Do I, am I happy that I had to have those challenges to be where I am now? I don't think that I, I would want those challenges in my life, but, but, but they happened <laughs> and there's nothing I can do to change it. So here we are. <laughs> and I'm glad I get to share my story and be on this podcast with you and Crystal. Yeah, Crystal, it seems like medical debt and student loan debt are these just huge categories Um, that most of us aren't really aware of until we're in the midst of it. I totally agree. I mean, these institutions are giving 18-year-olds who can't even, you know, go to a bar and buy a drink, essentially student loans that are worth mortgages. So I think there definitely needs to be a huge overhaul in the system because so many people are being crushed right now. 
and we didn't even talk about this, Cynthia, but did either of you guys have credit card debt? I mean, it doesn't sound like it's a big part of either of your stories. I can answer first. I did not have credit card debt. That was like that, that turning point. I had those other debts and I had expenses. So I would have needed to start accumulating credit card debt so much that I would not have been able to pay them off each month. And I think credit card debt is like 25.99%. So I did not want that. And that's why I did what I did. Uh, but to my, my story is, I mean, most of my upbringing, I was very, pretty responsible with money and very frugal. So those other giant expenses came upon me suddenly and I what didn't have the emergency funds or the risk buffers to be able to handle them when they hit. And because of my upbringing, I don't know that my parents would have had the knowledge. They didn't at that time either like have that experience or knowledge to, in order to help me. So I had to figure it out myself. Crystal, Cynthia just said an interesting thing. She said, I've been mostly responsible with my money throughout my life. Does being in debt mean you're being irresponsible? I mean, do the two go together? No, I think a lot of, not always, I think a lot of people just don't have the education and and that's what it really comes down to. Yeah, it's an interesting point because again, you know, if you have medical debt, right, there's nothing you can do about that. If you get sick and you're stuck with medical bills, you're stuck with medical bills. And we tend to look at student loan debt is a positive thing also, right? You're going to school. It's good to spend money on yourself and on education. Crystal, I want to ask you the same question I asked Cynthia. Anything about your debt journey that you now regret or that you do differently? This may sound insane, but no. It was a very crazy time period, but it it taught me so much. And now I know that I will never be in that same situation again. And I'm with the knowledge that I have now, I'm able to subsequently change my family tree through that experience. Yeah, I'm wondering if a lot of people would say the same thing, that there are mistakes that get you into debt, but usually when you start the trip out of debt, there are many less mistakes to be made, I think, because once you kind of figure out the path you need to take, it's a little bit more straightforward. Cynthia, we've been talking about your individual stories, but we haven't broadened it out. In my introduction, I gave some numbers about the state of debt in America today. What what do you think about that? I mean, do we have a major debt problem in America today? I do believe we have a specific show. And I can just tell too from Looking around the peers around me in the Bay Area, many people live paycheck to paycheck. And that's, I can't judge them because we each do as we are. We're humans and, and we, we like nice things and everyone's debt is different. Some, some person with a really nice Tesla may be in debt or may not be in debt. And their story is their own. I, I wouldn't be able to judge or know what their circumstances. But I think that there can be more education. Uh, I think the the country and an individual lives would be better. People would be more empowered to be free and not be scared. I, I You asked this question and it's difficult, but I mean, and I think it will go on for a long time into history, but for at this moment, there is a show called Squid Game on Netflix. And I, I watched it because Crystal mentioned it and I'm not done with the, the whole series yet. But that has me thinking about debt, too, and the consequences of debt. Yeah. So the Squid Game is a Korean, I'd almost say a mini series on Netflix, where the premise is that people who have major money problems are in major debt can join this game where if they win, they win a huge grand prize. But if they lose, they die. Right. So you start with a huge number of people and there's only one winner. Uh, and it has certainly captured the world zeitgeist at the moment. Crystal, it kind of begs an important question, because especially if you've been watching Squid Game, you really kind of start feeling the for the characters. Is this a personal problem or a systemic problem? I mean, we're looking at these numbers of how many people are in debt in America. Squid Game is now one of the most popular shows out there. It's the story of people who are kind of down on their luck and stuck with debt. I wonder how much of this is doing better ourselves versus creating better systems and laws? I would say we, this is definitely a systemic issue and there needs to be a change in our laws. Um, 
there's only so much that we can do personally, but I feel like a lot of, you know, debt is encouraged. The price of tuition is going up exponentially year over year. If that wasn't allowed to happen, then they probably wouldn't be making these crazy student loans. So, it, you know, I think it's a it's a very large problem. And Cynthia, obviously, this is not something you're going through, but do you think the pandemic has changed the game? Do you think it's made people's debt better or worse? Or is America worse off than it was a few years ago? I can't say because I don't have that data. And I only, I only know what happens inside my my little box of where I live. But I did look, I, I cleaned up my room this weekend and I looked at the bag of makeup that I used to put on for work. And it's not that I don't use a whole lot of makeup, but I would, I work professionally. So I, you know, lipstick, a little bit of mascara and whatnot, but I hadn't had to put makeup on for about a year and a half. And I was just thinking makeup's expensive, especially good quality makeup. That's not going to make your skin itch and whatnot. And little things like that. It's nice not not having to drive and not needing to put on makeup. But I also realize me working from home is a luxury because I work in tech and, and do what I do. Then there are many people that do, did not have that luxury and do not have that luxury now during the pandemic. Crystal, if I'm correct, you also are a virtual worker. Was there a point where you're like, Whew, don't have to spend on more clothes, don't have to spend on transportation, don't have to put the makeup on today. I mean, has the virtual world that's now kind of common for, for many people, has it made paying off debt or at least saving money easier for you? Yes, without question. I would say, you know, coronavirus was devastating for the entire world, but it was one of the catalysts to be being able to pay off my debt because I didn't have the monthly commuting costs from New Jersey to New York. I didn't have to worry about, you know, the makeup, buying new clothes, wasn't really going to get my hair and nails done. Everything was shut down. Travel was strict, was reduced. So all that money just went straight to debt. So Cynthia, your stories, both of yours are quite inspiring did it end when you got out of debt or tell me about some of your new financial goals? Once you hit that zero net worth, what financial goals sprung up after that? Well, for me, I would say that I'm working on maxing out my retirement. So my 401k, I'm also working on contributions to my Roth IRA. And then also again, just quarterly tracking of my net worth to make sure we're going in the right direction. And Cynthia, I've heard you mention FIRE, financial independence, retire early. Is there a, a retire early goal somewhere in your future? Yes, there is. And I have to share now too, one of the new habits I developed on this financial journey is on New Year's Eve, instead of watching fireworks, I sit there and stare at a spreadsheet and <laughs> multicolor all my numbers. <laughs> and last year, I found my FIRE number. It was, unlike Crystal, I don't like to know the exact numbers. I like to ballpark it and then just shoot for it. Just aim in that general direction. So I realized the way I was going, I would have retired at 62, which is I want to retire when I still look great in a swimsuit. That's my goal. So <laughs> I my, my fire number, I hope it's obtainable and I'm hustling, but I'm hustling in a different way. I got out of debt August of 2020. And right now I'm trying to figure out how do I get to my fire number? And by doing that, it's, it's a different strategy. I'm still building my foundation, but I'm trying to figure out how to increase my income so that I can reach my fire age and fire number. Cynthia, we haven't really talked about housing, buying houses, et cetera, but would you ever get into debt again? Or have you gotten in debt with like a house loan or anything like that? That's a very interesting question because that has been on my mind for the last few months. And just yesterday, I sat down with someone else who is doing fire and we talked in depth about house hacking in the Bay Area. And, and do, would you like to explain what house hacking is, Dr. G? House hacking is when you buy a property and often you live in it or a part of it and then rent out the other part. It's a way of using the house you live in as a way to make money or you do a live and flip, right? So you can move into it and fix it up while you're living there. And basically it turns your 
house, which often is one of your biggest budget items and instead turns it into an asset. How beautiful would it have been if I had bought a house this year to conclude my story? But after sitting down with this fellow friend and we spent, I think, like three or four hours just running the numbers, even if I house hacked, I would make more money investing it in my retirement accounts, like Crystal had said, than house hacking in the Bay Area as we stand now, just because the market is so high and rent is so different from the actual cost of a house in the Bay Area. So that's something I did learn since since like from, from my fire journey is to do a lot more research and ask people and, and learn before diving into something, even if it's a passion, even if the idea sounds brilliant at that moment, there is no, no nothing in life that can't be slowed down and, and thought upon before doing something. Crystal, is there some trepidation about taking on mortgage debt after going through all you've gone through? Absolutely. I would love to have a house, but I live in the tri-state area where, again, the cost of houses are just insane. And I've gotten very used to having a decent rent. I feel like in terms of pursuing financial independence, it's better for me right now to stay where I am. But who knows, that may change in the future. So, Cynthia, I asked the easy question about what do you take on mortgage debt? Let's go for the tougher question would you take on a significant other who had debt issues? I think actually the house one is, is it easier? Well, it's harder and easier. Would I take on a significant other that was in debt? I'd say yes, because I know now that I have the knowledge of how to get through it. And I would hope that my significant other would be open-minded enough and excited and listening to my ideas for how to get them free too. And I do realize that the majority of Americans, I don't know about the majority, but a good number of Americans are in debt and have not been exposed to all these different resources that I've seen. So of course I'd be willing to share it with not just that person, but put anyone that that would want to hear it. Like I'm, I'm willing and open to sharing the stuff that I have learned to others because it doesn't take away from me. And that's the great thing about this community. I don't lose anything by helping you get further along. Crystal, could you date a, or have a significant other that had major debt? Well, I do have a significant other and he is debt free. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I don't really have to face that question right now, but we actually went on the journey together. So after seeing how fired up I was about this, this whole thing, he endeavored to pay off his student loans as well. And he's debt free as of last year. So, you know, I brought him along to Camp Fi and we're talking about retirement right now and trying to get on that train. Yeah. You know, it's amazing to me after listening to your stories, you both hit some very low points, right? Cynthia living in your car, Crystal looking at that credit score and wondering how you're going to afford transportation. And yet now, a bunch of years later, we're talking about financial independence and retiring early. What a difference a few years makes. And what's very clear from both of your stories is that there was this moment where your mindset changed. And then once you did that, you could discover Dave Ramsey or join these Facebook groups and start working on your debt. Both of your stories are quite inspiring. I want to end this episode the way I end every episode by asking you what's up next in your life and where people can find you. Cynthia, if people want to know more, how can they connect with you and what's going on next in your life? If you want to find me, LinkedIn is a great place to find me professionally. But as a side hustle, I also sell I also sell local grown snacks, which is dehydrated persimmons in the Bay Area. And one day it might be dehydrated snacks from around the world. But you could also hit me up there. And what is next? Dehydrating persimmons because it's a seasonal fun activity. So I'll be doing that for the rest of this year. Yeah, we just entered persimmon season, I believe, because we just bought a bunch. If people want to know more about that business, is there a website they can go to? Yes, it would be www.localgrownsnacks.com. And Crystal, what's up next in your life and how can people reach you if they want to? 
well, right now I have a birthday vacation plan to Antigua. So that's next for me in November. <laughs> but other than that, professionally, you can find me on LinkedIn where I talk a lot about career, career stuff and, and tips. And then on Instagram at redesign underscore possible. It's sort of my money page. This has been the Earn and Invest podcast. On behalf of myself, Doc G, I wanted to thank Crystal Pearson and Cynthia Ye. That's a wrap. Have you been considering investing in real estate? If you have, the best place to go to learn about this asset class is the Real Estate and Financial Independence Podcast with Coach Carson. Here, Chad, aka The Coach, talks about real estate and gives you all the tips and tricks. But not only that, but he has guests on real proof of concept about how to reach financial independence by mastering this tricky asset class. Check them out. Real Estate and Financial Independence Podcast with Coach Carson. It is a must listen to if you think real estate is going to be part of your financial holdings. The easiest way to get there is to go to coachcarson.com. Again, coachcarson.com. Take a listen. You won't regret it. Sweet. Perfect. Awesome. That was a lot of fun. Did you, were there any things you, you guys feel like we didn't cover? Things you really wanted to talk about? No, I think we hit on a lot. What about you, Cynthia? I would say like the one thing, I mean, we hit on a lot. And I don't know if this is something to talk about like in the future, but there is a, the generational thing, right? Like both from, you had brought it up a little bit about my parents not knowing about this stuff. And then I'm like, my grandparents didn't know about this stuff. Like, <laughs> and their parents didn't know about this stuff. Like, oh, you know, me teaching my kids and how they'll be set up for success and what I want this upon them. I think that would be an interesting twist, but you did hit touch upon it. And I, I appreciate that. Crystal, do you I think... Also... Go ahead. No, go I ahead. I was also going to say with the systemic part of it, that I probably should have gone into it more, but... Again, especially when you're thinking about black and brown people, we're historically just underbanked. We're not really investing in the stock market as much due to various, you know, historical circumstances. So I think that that is another reason why a lot of times we're just not as ahead financially. Yeah. Yes, my grandparents don't do this, any stocks in retirement. It's their savings and cash in their pocket because they're afraid. Mm -hmm. So that's not something they would have taught their kids and my parents would have to learn on their own. So I'm wondering, Crystal, is, do you feel the communities are different? People of color, uh, debt communities versus kind of more general debt communities. Are you noticing that the concerns are different or that it ha they have a different culture or feel to them? I would definitely say the concerns are a little bit different. Um, there's a, especially when it comes to the fire movement, there's a, a kind of a misconception that everybody is high earners and you have to be like an engineer or a doctor to pursue this stuff. So a lot of people, you know, feel discouraged, especially if they haven't had access to the same educational opportunities. So that is something that, you know, I, I've noticed and just in having conversations. Yeah, I've noticed, I've always said about the the thing about the fire community is the way I came into it is you tend to pay attention to people who look and sound like you. Mm -hmm. And so it's really easy to think that everyone has your same experience. And uh, one of the eye-opening things about having a podcast is thankfully I've had a varied enough uh, number of panelists mm -hmm. in an audience that I've really got to see kind of different cultures and concerns that I didn't think about just because, again, I was so busy connecting to people who looked and sounded like me. And it took a lot of time to start thinking of a little more outside the box and realizing that there was, there are other conversations going on that were important and interesting that I was missing. Well, I also think that's why I had such a great time at Camp Fi, because to be quite honest, before coming there, I had this idea in my mind, like, are these going to be very elitist people? Are they going to be easy to connect with? Is it just going to be kind of a bunch of tech bros but when I got there, it wasn't that at all. There were, you know, a multitude of different people from different professions, different ages. And I feel like it's it's important for that to be highlighted because financial independence or debt freedom isn't for people who just for people who look a certain way or have certain credentials. I think I really wanted to come across that that this can be accessible. 
Yeah. Yeah. I think it's an important message. And, and certainly, um, I know whenever someone says, Oh, you know, what were you doing last week? And I'm like, Oh, I went to this campfire. I went to something like that. And yeah, the look on people's faces is just, they, I think there's a lot of preconceived notions about what, what these gatherings are. And I think when you go to them, you realize it's, you know, when someone gets dragged there, right. By a significant (laughs) other, you drag your significant others, like they don't want to go. And then they're like, Oh, this is not what I expected. (laughs) People are nice and they're not strange. No, everybody's been so great. I'm already, you know, making friends. I've been texting with Cynthia on the side. So it, it was a really great experience, but I realized that a lot of the people that would benefit from those conversations, they just aren't in the room at these events. And I just wonder mm-hmm. how do we spread this message more, more broadly, because I think it would um, really enhance the, the quality of a lot of people's lives. I think the debt community is a natural feeder actually into Mm -hmm. financial independence and fire. Um, But you've got to still get to that point where you're like feeding into the Dave Ramsey's and the debt communities first, um, which I think still people struggle with. Um, But, you know, the, you know, the common theme is when you talk to people who paid off lots of debt is most of them started by hearing about Dave Ramsey. Yeah, I think you know, he, he gets a lot of people in, interested in finances and really invested in it, but then most people branch off to, to yeah. other things. So there's an evolving yeah. that goes on. <laughs> you get past that initial part and you're like, okay, I don't need that anymore. <laughs> yeah. Cause of... I, I think it's just, he's very prescriptive in nature and yeah. you know, when you're a mess, you kind of need the prescription, but after a while, when you get things under control, I think that every personal finance is personal, right? So people go off and find their own methods and and kind of do what works for them. And, and that's why I sort of branched off to the fire community because I I wanted to do what worked for me. I agree though. I think his seven steps was, it's very digestible for those that are desperate and scrambling. Like, I think if all the stuff that we talk about was given to someone that's surviving and death is overwhelming. Yeah. And I think the debt, you know, the debt question is fairly prescriptive, right? So when you've got a big debt problem, there are only a certain amount of choices, right? You got to pay it off. <laughs> you've got to save money. You've got to, you know, get rid of those credit cards. There's there's a certain number of things. But I think once you get past that, then as Crystal was saying, it's, there's you know, there's a lot more choices. Like, do I want financial independence? Do I not want financial independence? Do I want to do it slowly? Do I want to do it quickly? Do I want to you know, do I want to have a job I'm passionate about? Do I want to finish working so I can do hobbies that I'm passionate about? I mean, there's lots and lots of, of branching points. Hmm. Yeah. And I, I think, think that even with the part, the part about our partners and would we date somebody that's in debt, mm-hmm. I found that my partner was just very level-headed the entire time where I was just like crying, <laughs> like, what am I going to do? My life is over. And he's like, listen, just, you need to pay it off. Yeah. to your to your point and he was just kind of that grounding force whenever i was you know losing it a little bit and i think we all need that whether it's your significant other or whether it's friends because there are going to be times when you feel super discouraged and like this is never going to end so you need like people to be that voice of reason yes i like that question and i also liked how you asked um about were we fairly responsible and, and like really focusing on like the student and the medical debt because first of all it makes crystal and i look better you know like that we're (laughs) responsible but but i also i really do think that we are fairly on average like responsible individuals it's not like we're walking in with all this stuff and purses and our (laughs) lamborghini to the fire event (laughs) with gold everywhere we were like fairly like moderate people and yet we had this huge debt (laughs) and i believe many people are like that (laughs) And the truth, I mean, I, I believe the majority of people in debt aren't there because they wanted to be there. Yes, there's there's going to be a small number of people who are like, screw it. I'm just going to frivolously borrow and, and not do what I'm supposed to do. But probably the majority of people in debt don't want to be there, didn't purposefully get there like, I'm going to screw myself, right? They probably thought mm-hmm. they were doing something that was going to help them eventually and then found that it didn't work. Um, and I think that's important because I, I think... And we didn't talk about this here, but we talked about can't fight this whole idea of shame. I don't, I think we have to let go of that, especially if you're going to kind of start feeling that hope again that you guys were talking about. You like have to let go of the shame, start feeling the hope. 
And I, I don't, I think especially because of student loan debt and medical debt, uh, I don't think it's a responsibility issue per se for a, a, a huge chunk of people. Yeah. And I, you know, I think that that vulnerability and being transparent about your story helps to free you from whatever embarrassment or kind of shame you might be feeling because now people know and people are relating to you on the same level. So you realize, okay, I'm not an anomaly. Yeah. Well, it is very important. I am glad I am better able to be vulnerable. It is a double edged sword. And, and that like at least four times, I almost fell into some pretty big scams before I found Camp Fi. And that's something that we really? didn't talk about. Yeah. I don't know if you didn't ever get caught. <laughs> People would say like Dave Ramsey and choose FI and then I would believe them and then follow them into either creepy apartments in Berkeley where I'm like all of a sudden like being mm-hmm. scammed into oh what's it like like MLMs. Am- like MLMs like buying yeah. am- amber or something, like you buy houseware products and Amway. soaps and whatnot. Amway. Amway. Yes, I was Amway's been Amway around. Thing. Someone tried to sell me Amway when I was in college. <laughs> Back in the 90s. I, Amway's been around for a long time. Let me tell you. So there's Amway. And then there was another one with a rich dad, poor dad. And, and yeah. then someone universal life insurance like scams, like what they pay 400 and some $36 yeah. per in- month. Infinite banking. Yeah, there's lots of infinite banking. Well, I feel there. like people think I'm trying to scam them when I talk about like Camp Fi and... <laughs> Because. Hey, Ramsey, they're like, what the hell? Like the fire community, what is this? A lot of people, they think it's strange and they think it's kind of cultish or Cynthia. I don't know if you've ever experienced that uh, before. Uh. Things before, I, I mean, when I went to Camp Five two years ago, I was, my guard was up. I was ready to run just in case it was another scam because we're making ourselves vulnerable. It, that is that double-edged sword in that there are scams preying on people that are in that situation and they just say those right words, these familiar terms. And you're like, I want to get out of debt. Yeah. It's also the evolution of a movement, right? So in, when you have the, the first, you know, the early adopters, you don't have nearly as many scams, but as the movement gets bigger and gets more successful then the people move in who want to make money off of it. And so we're definitely there with financial independence. You definitely have, you know, people moving in who are selling things who are like, this is my opportunity to to make some money. So 